are uh, starting section 1.5. We are going to talk about graphs. of trig functions. Probably today we get to talk about graphs of sine and cosine. So <clears throat> our long term plan is of course to take a look at all, all trig functions. So yeah. Uh, later on, we want to also look at tangent of x. These would be the three basic ones, and their reciprocals then is going to be cosecant of x and secant of x and cotangent of x. We are going to treat these things as a secondary, and these are the primary. These being the reciprocal of those, uh, uh, so we are going to be f faster on coverage of these items. <coughs> now, uh, what we need to know is some basic items from uh, college algebra. What do you mean by graph of a function? What are the basic ideas there? So I'm going to do a quick review of this. And remember, on the website there are. Uh, much more extensive reviews of college algebra. You can go to a couple of courses. I put the link for them. And also your the MML software has the full text with the college algebra component. You can refer to that too for uh, review. So what do we mean by graph? Uh, what is a graph? Well, you have graphed some uh, basic functions in your, your uh, college algebra classes, like y is equal to 2x plus 3, or y is equal to x squared and such. Uh, you might have a little bit of uh, kind of automatic responses to them, and uh, you might have forgotten what the basic idea was. So let's go back to the very basic, even though we're still looking at uh, those examples. Uh, and. Uh, just familiarize ourselves with the concepts as well as uh, the terminology. So suppose I have a formula which says the quantity y is related to quantity x through this relationship, y is equal to x squared plus x. That's a formula in algebra. What we want to do is to take a picture of this formula. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is essentially a verbal description of some relationship. We want to create a picture of it. There are a variety of ways of doing this. The most famous one is due to Descartes, which says uh, consider two real number lines so you consider your number lines x and y. And whatever x and y that fit in this relationship, you pick that out and put the corresponding point on this page. So for example, if for x equal to 1, for x equal to 1, I have y equal to 2 in this relationship. I put x equal to 1 and y equal to 2. and that is going to be a picture of this single point of that formula. And the more of these points you have, the better picture you are going to have. Just like in your electronic devices, the more pixels you got, the more resolution you got. Same thing here. You want better, you pay more. The way you pay more is by patiently uh, picking these things out and putting in there, but of course you take a course in algebra or something to try to be faster than uh, this tedious style of just picking up points and putting in there. So, so the most basic thing you do is to make a table. So in this table, for example, we said if x is 1, is y is 2, let's put some other numbers, 
if x is 0, y is 0. If x is 2, I have 2 squared and a 2 makes a 6. So I have 2 and 6. Uh, 3, 4, 5, 6. So some point here. So let's remember this was 0, 0. This was 1, 2. This was 2, 6. Of course, I'm making life easy on myself by picking uh, friendly numbers. I could have as well insisted on seeing what happens at x being one and a half, just that you have to either use your calculator or remember a little bit uh, of arithmetic by itself. This is one and a half, and one and a half squared is 2.25, and you add it, you make 3.75, so <coughs> we pick on these numbers essentially because we are starting or we are lazy or something like that, not that those are holy or something specific about them. Uh, 1.5, so uh, here's 1.5 and, and 3.75, that's going to give me some point in between. So if I patiently pick all the numbers in between 1 and 2, it looks like I'm going to fill in between 1 and 2 here. But then, of course, that takes time. That's the issue. So we try to guess our way out of the situation or take a course in algebra and such to be confident about this guess that we are making. We are making a guess that the graph is going to start from here and nicely go over these things. Well, it kind of looks like a nondescript line. Perhaps somebody might think it is a straight line or something. Of course, it is not so. <clears throat> and that's another issue. These numbers that you are picking could mislead you, that they could uh, not give you the whole picture, just give you half truth or something. What is missing here, for example, what is missing is that we are missing all the negative inputs. What if I had x equal to minus 1? minus 1, we start saying something interesting. Minus 1 squared is plus 1, and then minus 1 together, they make 0. So at minus 1, if I had just drawn the uh, green line, I would have been likely to think that this just keeps going down like this. But by picking this point, I realize it has to come back up. So that gives me a little bit of encouraging news, that this is not just some boring picture that just, uh, has no features or something. Other stuff are happening. So I go and try one more. Minus 2. Minus 2 squared. Now with the negative numbers, we have to be more careful uh, in our substitution. The best strategy is to wrap your number in a parenthesis so you don't make sign mistakes. Minus 2 squared is going to be plus 4. Many students think it is minus 4, but it's plus 4. And minus 2 adds up to a 2. So at minus 2, I have come back to the same height. So obviously this is turning turning around. That is, my guess is, uh, my guess is that this is going down and then coming back up, and that's a trend that it has. Now in college algebra, you learn that there is a name for this curve. What's the name of it? It's a parabola, a very famous. Uh, curve. Uh, what, uh, where do you see parabolas? What kind of objects or natural phenomena utilize the shape of a parabola? Arch, uh, arch, talking about Missouri arch. Yeah, that's very close to the shape of a parabola. That's another curve that's called cosine hyperbolic. If you had time for uh, hyperbolic trigonometric function. Uh, so the arc in uh, Missouri is based on actually a form of a trig function. It's called hyperbolic trig function. The ones that you're studying are circular trig. These guys are hyperbolic trig based on the shape of a hyperbola. And the shape of it at the beginning looks like this. We are kind of getting off topic here, but uh, that thing That's actually a famous curve, too. If you have a cable, let's see, a 
any wires like you need to have extensive uh, heavy cable like uh, utility cables and such if you hold it it stands in the shape of this curve it's called cosine hyperbolic the ones in Missouri is the same curve turned upside down and uh, for certain architectural reasons or stability reasons they have picked that shape I don't know exactly if you guys go become an engineer and find out why they use that curve it, it gets to be used in the design of smokestacks and such this is different though parabola is a lot simpler uh, so let me ask the question again where, where do you see this uh, shape one example of it is on the roof of uh, half the houses uh, in the city what object is it that use, uses the shape of a parabola Again, we are off topic here, but I just want to mention that these things we talked about do have applications. So what do you have on the roof of your home or on your backyard? Most likely you have, what does it look like? Uh, let me draw more. Oh, a TV. Mm -hmm. A TV dish, yes. A satellite antenna is based on the shape of a parabola. If you take a parabola, just... You don't have one of those. Uh, lucky you. You're not wasting money, not wasting time either. Uh, uh, so you take a, a parabola, uh, turn it in a space, turn it around its own axis like this. If I take this thing and turn it around, kind of a cone looking shape, uh, you take a piece of this, the shape of uh, satellite antennas, you use the wider form of this. Uh, well, why do they use that? Why would they use parabolas if not like uh, uh, something looking like a bowl? You know, if you take a sphere, somebody might think, well, let's take uh, just a regular salad bowl and put it on the uh, on the roof of the house and try to get the satellite signals using that. What's the main property of parabolas that makes them to be the most useful in that? that regard well let me tell you shallow. Or shallow. well yes that too <laughs> but uh, you are just you are using a, a section of this shape so the leaves can slide off of this bowl as well as it slides off of this one what do you expect from your satellite antennas to give you a good signal? The question is, what shape collects the signal the best? What do you mean by that? Well, here is your shape that you're after. Here is your satellite so far away, it's almost like infinity. That satellite is sending signals. Those signals are coming to you in a parallel set of waves. When they come and hit the metallic surface or the special paint that is on this thing, you expect that all those signals bounce off and do what? You don't want them to scatter all over the place. You, they want them, after they bounce off, they have to all converge to the same point. So this shape has to have the property of focusing all of this beam at a single point. If you manage to do that, you get the most gain or most magnification of your signal. If this thing scatters the, the, the bounced waves all over the place, then your signal is going to be weak. So what we want from our, our shape is that is, it has to have a focus or the focal point. What do you put at that focal point when you look at that antenna? What do you see in front of this? this point there's a gizmo here that is uh, the receiver the receiver is collecting all that wave so you want to put the receiver at the focus the shape has to have the property that all the waves that are coming from far away regardless of where they hit on this uh, shape they all have to come back to the single point and get all focused at that one point. Well, the only shape in the universe that has that property that 
focuses a parallel beam of light or signals at the single point is the parabola. Parabolas have a focal points. If you went through the your college algebra class in the more than more than just the basic ideas, they would have told you about the focal point of a parabola as well. Anyway, any parabola has a focal point, and anything, any wave that comes from far away after it hit, hits the surface of this parabola, it bounces in such a way that it always comes back to the same focal point. It doesn't matter where it hits it. Very interesting property. That's the claim to fame of the parabola. Well, where else would you use such a feature? You can use it in reverse as well. huh? You can put a source of light here. When light hits this parabolic mirror, when it comes out, it's going to be a parallel beam of light. Yes? Yeah, flashlights, searchlights. You see uh, these searchlights, they bring uh, to opening ceremonies or something. They put four of them on the back of a truck. It dances and lights up the sky. Actually, they constructed those things around World War I for lighting up the clouds to see the enemy airplanes to shoot them down and such, but by now it's just a, uh, for opening ceremonies. What do you want there? If you have this light that is coming out, if it spreads, if it spreads, you cannot light up the clouds. You have to have them all focused on a single beam so that you have some concentration. And again, the only shape that can do that is a parabolic shape. So they put a very high intensity uh, uh, spark here, or a special arc here. It creates light. The light goes back and hits the parabolic mirror and comes out. Uh, flashlights, headlights, and such, they use some principle similar to this. OK, so parabolas get to have some um, existence outside of our just algebra classes sine and cosine the same way. They are used extensively all over the place. We are just learning some mathematical basis of it. Okay, so what did we learn? Let's go come back to our regular scheduled program. What we have is here, we are learning about graph. What's a graph? Graph is a picture of a formula. What do you do if you forget all the formulas and such? We have this default procedure of so-called point plotting. Point plotting is very primitive. The caveman approach to graphing is point plotting. So I don't know any formula. Well, okay, I go make a table, graph each of the points in the table, connect them, keep praying that I have not made any mistakes, anything looks uh, too far off. I go and double check my table, come back, and hope that everything is working. So if all else fails, remember, you have a calculator. You can always plug in your numbers, make a table, and graph. The question that we have is, well, can we do a little bit better than that? Can we be a little bit faster and such? Now, before we go to issues of uh, speeds and such, let me see uh, in, uh, in this picture some names we want to learn. What is the name of this point, as well as this point? What do you call that? When you hit this axis, uh, this is called x-intercept. Is that right? X-intercept is a point where you hit the x-axis. Wherever you cross the x-axis becomes the x-intercept. How do you find it? X-intercept means you have neither gone up nor down compared to the x-axis. X-intercept has the property that your y is 0. So if you want to find where that is, you put your y equal to 0. You solve that equation, however you learn to solve that equation in your algebra classes. And these are what you call x-intercepts. Now this other x-intercept happens to also be a y-intercept. So we need to know the idea of x-intercept. We need to have the idea of a y-intercept, and there are other intercepts to learn. 
Next issue is the idea with domain. Domain simply means all the numbers that are legitimate to use on this left side of your table, which are all the numbers that are legitimate for you to start at on the x-axis. Any x that is legitimate to be used here falls in the domain. So what are the x's that are legitimate to use here? Do I ever encounter any hard time if I'm squaring something or adding two numbers? Well, uh, no. There is nothing here that is off limit. So the domain of this is all numbers from minus infinity to plus infinity. The set of all numbers, sometimes we call it the real numbers. Sometimes they have uh, this funny notation with R with a double uh, vertical bar on the left of it. So that's a domain. How about the range? The range is set of all numbers that show up here. That is typically a harder issue to figure out what's the range of some function. So what is the range you think in this case? Range set of all y values. Again, what does that mean? Like this is a y value. Let me cast a shadow on my y axis, see what kind of y's did I get. This is another y value. This is another y value. This is another y value. Do all the y values cover up the entire y axis? Like I didn't see any points shadow being down here. Only I got the coverage on this section of the picture. That is, this parabola opens up. It is missing the bottom half. Unlike the x, it, uh, the domain, which any kind of x was fair to use here, any type of y doesn't show up here. y has the lowest value, and then after that, all the values start showing. I do not get anything. Uh, down in this section. So this one is in the domain, excuse me, this is in the range. This section is not in the range. Essentially, to figure out what's the range of a function, full scale of it, need to actually take a calculus class, it's hopefully what you're going to take later on. But for simple functions like this, you can work your way around uh, some issues and find out. For example, where do you think is this point? Remember, this was 0, this was minus 1. Uh, at what point do you think I'm turning around? Minus a half, is that right? So I go and try at minus a half. I put it in this function, minus a half squared plus minus a half, it's a quarter minus a half, that is a quarter. So at this thing, uh, excuse me, minus a quarter. That looks like to be the lowest point. This point has the coordinate of minus a half and a minus a quarter. That's the turning point. We can figure this out more uh, systematically using completion of squares, but let's just keep going right now. This parabola has a turning point. Uh, when you take your college algebra course, they call it a vertex. It's the tip of the parabola. Any shape that we consider, so for that shape, we are going to talk about x-intercepts, y-intercepts, turning points and some other features. So these are the basic uh, facts that we are going to be uh, interested in. Uh, some of the other items in uh, college algebra that are going to play a role here is the idea of asymptotes. Let's take a function that uh, shows that property of an asymptote. Let's take like 1 over x minus say, 3. Suppose we want to graph such a function. Again, first time facing it, best strategy is to make a table so that our, we get our feet wet with this thing and try to figure out what's going on. 
what is our typical uh, approach to these problems? Pick some of the friendly numbers and plug it in, see what happens. Again, that's a very uh, simplified approach. Well, I can take a zero and plug it in this, so I get one, one over minus three or minus one third, or minus a half, minus one over one. What do I get at three? It looks like one over zero, huh? What is one over zero? No, zero over one is zero, but one over zero is not zero. One over zero is undefined. Okay, so in uh, basic arithmetic classes, you see, division by zero is not allowed. The answer is undefined and such. It's like telling kids don't play with matches. When you grow up, you have to cook. You have to play with matches. So, in elementary classes, they tell you don't define, don't divide by zero. But when you come to a university, you say, "Well, I'm a grown man now, a grown woman. I, uh, I am gonna do things you told me not to do. So I'm gonna divide by zero. So this is actually gonna become most defined point of the whole picture for us, and that is where the asymptote is gonna happen. So. This is, this is a crucial moment. In elementary school, they say avoid it. If you grow up and say, well, let's see what's going on there. Other points essentially become boring points. Four, you put four here, one, five, you put one half, six, you put in it, one third. Nothing going on in these places. This is the interesting spot. And that is, we are gonna make fuss about this situation. Uh, so, Let's go ahead and graph the information we already have, see what is it that we have. We have like zero, at zero we have minus one third. Let me choose my, uh, let me redraw this thing so that. Uh, so this is, say this is my one, so one, two, three, four, five, and six. At zero, we have minus one third. Where is minus one third? Minus one third. So this is minus one, this is gonna be minus one third. At the one, I have minus a, minus a half. At two, I have minus one. So I have this something like this going on here. At three, all hell breaks loose. We don't know what's going on. Four, it becomes one. Five becomes a half. Six becomes a third. So, not much is going on here. Most common mistake students make is to say, okay, I don't know what's going on at three, but here is what went at two, and this is what happened at four, so I connect these two. What is wrong with that? Plenty, so just about everything is wrong about it. Actually, some calculators used to do something like that too, so. Essentially, you are saying if x is three, y is gonna be zero if you draw a line like this, but it's undefined. This is pretty well defined. So wh what's going on? We don't know what's going on at three, so we say if you don't know, put a magnifying glass around it and try to, to reinvestigate. Reinvestigate. So I, let's let's make room here and investigate right next to it. Uh, okay. Here's my magnifying glass. I want to put a magnifying glass around this situation. So my center is at uh, uh, three up to four, what other numbers am I willing to live with? So we are forced to live with some fractional numbers. So suppose I say three and a half. Remember our formula was one over x minus three. If I put three and a half for x here, this is x, this is y, what do I get? Three and a half minus three, so one over a half. What is one over a half? With these things, we have to be quick so that we don't go back to a calculator to do it because there are so many of these things to do. This should happen in your mind. That's why we discourage the use of calculators. If you use calculator too much, 
you stall on these things so much you wouldn't be able to make a progress so one over a half is a two that's interesting at three and a half I got one two went up here so it looks like this guy is pulling up that's interesting let's try one more suppose I say 3.25 what do you think I'm gonna get now 1 over 3.25 minus 3 is 1 over 25 what's 1 over 25 4 so at 3.25 I got 1 2 3 4 so it looks like I'm shooting up that's interesting so I say okay let's go even closer 3.1 what do you think I'm gonna get now so this became four. Uh, this became four at 3.1 what do you think I'm gonna get so it's gonna be 3.1 minus 3 that's 0.1 you're asking what is 1 over 0.1 you're asking yourself how many dimes are in a dollar the answer is 10 so it's gonna get off the page by now so this function has a graph that is just going up without stopping going up without stopping brings us the idea of asymptote that there is a line here what is that line that's a line uh, uh, y excuse me x is equal to 3 it's a vertical asymptote When the function comes to uh, close to this thing, it's like an airplane coming close to the cliff of uh, a very tall mountain. It has to just pull up, There's no choice but to go all the way up. Similar thing happens on the other side, that this actually dives down. So the asymptote in this particular case has a presence up here as well as down here. We call that vertical asymptote. So vertical asymptote is where the function ruptures into pieces. It splits into components. So you cannot say this is undefined because it's like this is the most defined feature of the whole thing. Everything else that was happening was quite boring and nothing was going on there. This is just the only place where something of interest did happen. How do we uh, phrase it? We say we have a vertical asymptote. How do we give an address of it? We say x equals to the number at which division by zero happened. x equal to the root of the denominator specifies where the vertical asymptote is going to be. We are going to see plenty of these things when we deal with uh, trick functions. Why so? Because in trick functions we always have a ratio. In four of them at least we have a ratio. Uh, and the denominator in those ratios could be turned into a zero number so <coughs> that's why this thing comes up now uh, that's uh, since we don't have time to get into the sine or cosine themselves let's just complete this uh, list of uh, concepts we talked about today we talked about x intercept y intercept We talked about turning points. We talked about ver uh, vertical asymptotes. Yeah. There is also companion of this thing which yeah very good there is also horizontal asymptotes there are actually oblique asymptotes too but we don't have use for them right now we also talked about domain and range we didn't get to talk about symmetry but let's briefly talk about that as well 
So you want to make sure that you go through your college algebra uh, review section and familiarize yourself with all of these things. Let me just briefly mention a few words about symmetry. The idea of symmetry, well, it happens in nature often enough to uh, make it a worthy topic. Suppose you have a picture looking like this. Well, you notice something interesting about it, that the right and left part of it are identical, just moving in different direction. How would you characterize it, or how would you mention this property? You say the shape is symmetric with respect to what? Yes, sir. You say graph is, now we are going to have a lot of use for this phrase, symmetric with respect to and y-axis. Okay, symmetric with respect to. If you have a function whose graph has this property, you mean what? You mean that if I am on the right, say at this x, or I'm at the left, at this location, which is going to be the opposite of this is minus x, I have the same height. So you are saying if I take the x and plug it in my function, at this point, or take minus x and plug it in my function, like this point, I get the same height. These heights are the same. These are f of x and f of minus x. So this is f of x. This is f of minus x. So f of minus x being same as f of x is the recipe for the graph being symmetric with respect to y-axis. symmetric with respect to y-axis. Another way of describing this thing is that if I had a mirror placed on my y-axis, then a reflection of this yellow part will be the green part, or a reflection of the green part will be the yellow part. What does that mean? It means if I start at some location here, go straight to the mirror, go equal distance to the other side, I land right back on the function again. So this is essentially saying the y-axis is the mirror uh, of the picture. Okay, so when we are dealing with uh, uh, trig functions, some of them are going to be symmetric with respect to y-axis. Some of them are going to be respect, uh, symmetric with respect to the origin. You might remember this one as well. If you have a graph like this, you say it is symmetric with respect to what? Say, if I have a point here, if I go to the origin, equal distance to the other side, I land back where I was. A, pay, a picture that has this property is called symmetric with respect to origin. So if you have an x here, you plug it into the function. And you come to the minus x and plug it into the function. Here is a negative of whatever you got on the right hand side. That is, if I use minus x, what I get is minus whatever I got on the right hand side. So symmetric with respect to origin has this property uh, inverse. It's, uh, we don't use that terminology here. We just call it. Uh, there's another word they use for it. You might be familiar with that. Sometimes they call it an odd function. Odd function also have uh, are used as a as a terminology here. Okay. So you want to review college algebra. And on Monday, we actually start drawing sine and cosine. I want to ask you guys to actually read section 1.5, play with your calculator and the online facilities until we actually do it.